Um, it looks like the last uh, few stragglers have wandered in. Uh, first off, thank you very much for coming, and thank you for having me here. Um, it's definitely a pleasure to be here. So this talk, as it says up on the slides, is about uh, designing MVPs for enterprise customers. Provide a quick introduction in terms of who I am uh, before I get into the main part of the presentation. Uh, so um, this, this is me. I work for a company called Pulse Energy. Uh, during the course of the presentation, uh, if any of you are active on Twitter, please feel free to uh, tweet about the, um, anything that you find interesting, any sort of feedback you'd like to pass on about the presentation. I'd love to hear from you. Um, I, uh, I've been to India a few times before. Um, I spent a year and a half here uh, during the 2004-2005 period. Um, and during that period, I, had the, um, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to work together with Naresh and a few others to organize India's first conference on agile software development. Um, so it's, uh, it's really great to be invited back uh, several years later to see how, how much the conference has grown. At that point in time with the first conference, we had it um, at, uh, I, I don't remember the precise venue, but it was a, a university uh, just southwest of, uh, of Bangalore on the way to Mysore. Um, and uh, this is obviously a, a much uh, a, mu a much bigger um, uh, occasion. So in terms of what I do, I'm the product lead uh, at a company called Pulse Energy. What we do is we build energy management software um, where uh, what we do is we work with uh, some, of the, some of the world's largest energy utilities um, to help them deliver energy efficiency to uh, their commercial customers. So what we do is we uh, analyze energy use for commercial buildings um, and provide advice to the owners and operators of those buildings um, in terms of how they can improve their overall energy efficiency. For, for those people who are uh, familiar with what's going on in this space uh, pretty much across the world, there's been this transition where smart meters have been introduced. So digital meters have replaced analog meters for tracking things like electricity and gas consumption uh, by, by major uh, utilities. And what that's meant is that there is now a wealth of data about energy consumption um, in, in buildings, in homes and buildings, and, uh, and that's provided great opportunities for analysis and also uh, challenges associated with working with uh, big data sets for utilities. And so that's where my company comes in. So what we do is we collect all of that data, generally uh, it's on a five or 15 minute or an hourly basis uh, from these buildings, uh, aggregate them within our data centers and do various types of uh, analytics across that. So it's a bit of a meld of, um, uh, of uh, uh, machine learning and data intelligence as well as uh, be behavioral science in terms of being able to bring about behavior change to help people uh, adopt um, behaviors that are more in line with energy conservation. So part of what we do through the software that we provide to our customers is we allow them to uh, track and report on their energy consumption, the associated energy savings. Um, we help them identify anomalies in their consumption. So if there are, uh, if there's equipment that's left on in their building, um, if their building is behaving in an erratic way, we can help them identify what those problems are, identify what the potential savings are associated with addressing those problems, and help them build the business case to, uh, to improve their overall energy efficiency and reduce their bottom line um, as far as, uh, sorry, improve their bottom line and reduce their costs associated with uh, their energy spend. So part of what we do is also work with uh, occupants and uh, the building occupants and the general public. Um, so, the even though we, for for us being here in this space, um, we don't we don't own and operate this building, but um, energy is being consumed just to provide a comfortable environment for us to exist in. And so, uh, for for people who work work in in let's say an office building um, or a medical building. There are ways in which they, their, their behavior is contributing to the overall energy consumption of that building, and there are ways in which they can uh, uh, consume that energy more efficiently. So we help engage those people as well. The overall objective 
for us through energy efficiency is to try and address what, uh, what we perceive as being the, the, the most significant challenge facing the planet, uh, which is global climate change. At least in North America, about one third of the overall, uh, um, the overall greenhouse gas emissions come from heating, cooling, lighting, uh, and ventilating buildings. So it's, it's a big portion of our overall, um, our overall carbon footprint. So if we can have an impact, um, then that uh, goes directly to addressing uh, some of these problems. And so we, we deal with not just electricity, but natural gas, steam, water, et cetera. And, uh, and what we, wherever possible, we try and walk the talk. So we, we use the software that we build um, in order to analyze our own energy consumption, act on those recommendations to improve our energy efficiency. So that, that's just to provide some, uh, some context in terms of where I'm coming from with this talk. Uh, so before I proceed, I wanted to try and get to know you as the attendees a little bit better. Uh, so I just want to take a quick poll. How, how many people here work for a company that is involved in, in building products? OK, so that's good, most people here. How many people consider themselves to be uh, product managers? How about uh, product designers? Okay, what, what about more, is it more on the project management side? Are most people doing project management or product management? How about uh, software developers? And how many people here, for the products that you're building, it looked like almost everybody is involved in building uh, some type of product. How many people are involved in delivering products to enterprise customers? And so does, then how many people are involved in delivering products to, uh, to con the, in the, into the consumer market? Okay, so just a few. So, so that's good. So this, this talk is really looking at uh, some of the differences in terms of delivering products for enterprise customers versus products for uh, the consumer marketplace. So in terms of the, 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 the overall context, in terms of where I'm coming from with, with uh, this talk, basically the way that I look at things is that I think the product development landscape has shifted. So traditionally, uh, software development, building, building software products is being, is being perceived as being the constraint associated with uh, bringing new products to market. I don't think that that's the case anymore. I think that uh, the, the, bigger, the biggest risk is no longer can we, can we build software in order to solve this problem. It's really more about whether or not anybody will care about the product that we've built at the end of the day. Because if, frankly, the, the the marketplace out there, it's flooded with great products um, that nobody uses. So the challenge is not building a, uh, a well-polished uh, professional product. It's building a product that will actually deliver, deliver value and capture the attention of people um, within that marketplace. So that means that the emphasis is, is put much more on t in terms of what um, of how, how that product is designed, what need it's satisfying, and how successfully it satisfies that need. Um, some of the notions within this talk are inspired by uh, work that's happening um, within the, um, the, the growing field of design thinking. Um, how, how many people are familiar with design thinking? Okay. Um, so I, I don't really, it's, I'm not going into in, in detail within this talk, but um, the, the key idea is that um, uh, that, that there is that, that design is is really so uh, ha, has got such a significant impact in terms of the overall effectiveness of the products that we build. Frankly, thinking about it, developing software it's actually quite a constrained problem. Um, you are operating within a generally constrained uh, with a constraint set of tools that may have been pre-selected, pre predetermined, set of programming languages. You're solving problems that may have already been previously defined. Whereas des the designing a product is really, it's, it's wide open. There are so many different ways in which you can go, in which you can attempt to address a specific customer's need. Um, and the implications of the decisions that you make tend to be very far reaching. Um, and have significant, Im uh, significant implications on the overall success of your company. So as a result, being able to quickly explore this 
significant design space is one of the key challenges that I think face us as uh, individuals that are involved in, in, in bringing products to market. So what we want is a mechanism, a tool for, uh, for tackling this risk directly, this risk of uh, building products that, uh, that don't meet a market need that nobody will use. And so the MVP, or the, the minimal viable product, is a, is a tool for uh, meeting this purpose. So in terms of what an MVP is, uh, the, the, notion, the, I, the, um, the framework that I'm using within this talk is guided by uh, some of the thinking within uh, the, the Lean Startup by Eric Ries. And so Eric Ries defines an MVP as being a tool that will help entrepreneurs um, start the process of learning as quickly as possible with a key emphasis on learning, really trying to uh, build the simplest possible thing that will yield the greatest learning because of the fact that um, there's so much that we don't understand about, uh, about the consumer, about what will really engage the consumer um, in the marketplace. And so we want to be able to learn as much and as quickly as possible. So a, a few examples to elaborate on the, the idea of, an, of what an MVP looks like. Um, people may be familiar with the story of Groupon, certainly familiar with the company at this point in time. Uh, but where it started, its MVP was uh, a WordPress blog where the founders of Groupon posted uh, some deals that they'd arranged through some local retailers um, about uh, just, just to test to see whether or not people would be interested in purchasing deals um, in an online forum in order to, uh, and, and then cash them in at, uh, at retail, retailers in their vicinity. So, the, what they perceived as being their riskiest uh, proposition was whether or not people were going to go for this. So they were looking for a mechanism to be able to deliver it as quickly as possible. And setting up a simple blog required no development, a little bit of hosting. They were, able to, uh, they were able to test out that proposition. Turned out to be wildly successful. And they've turned into uh, one of the, uh, if not the fastest growing company to date, I think to reach uh, what was it, to reach a billion dollars in sales per year, I think, which they achieved uh, last year. Is it a billion dollars? Anyone know? Sorry? Four billion dollars. So not a bad start from a WordPress blog. Uh, another, another example is, um, is Dropbox, uh, where I, most, I, I'm sure most people are familiar with Dropbox. Um, the, the key idea behind Dropbox was seamless file sharing, which now seems to be intuitively obvious, but at the point in time that, um, the, that the product was first proposed, it seemed like this was a marketplace that was already saturated and uh, that there was not a significant customer demand for this type of a tool. Um, in order to be able to deliver the full product, it required significant development um, effort. Uh, so in order to be able to, to test out the product with the market and in order to raise capital, in order to support building out the full product, um, Dropbox launched a video which explained the, the promise, the potential of what could be delivered through uh, their type of online service. Um, and that, that video really helped catch fire and um, uh, went viral and spread the message about their product. So these are some fairly familiar stories of uh, MVPs of wildly successful companies. Um, I, I, another key, another very common example is uh, for, for, especially for companies within the consumer space just wanting to be able to test out a, a concept um, is to build a simple landing page, try and do some, uh, try and do some email capture, see who's, at, who's coming to the page, what kind of, uh, what kind of search traffic is being driven there, um, how, uh, what, 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 what is really going to engage? Is there, is there some sort of market out there for this type of a product? This is uh, a fairly standard technique, and you can do this before you have an actual product. So th these are fine, and these are examples from the consumer space. And so it's, you can see how these types of MVPs might work for companies that are in the, uh, that are in the B2C market. But what about for the rest of us that are selling to enterprise customers? 
um, what is there for us? Because really, sell, selling to an enterprise is different, and uh, it's different for a number of reasons. So I'm going to go through some of those right now um, in terms of like, uh, the difference between B2C versus uh, B2B. So one key one is obviously deal size. So when we're selling to enterprise customers, we're talking about not deals in the, in the tens or hundreds or even thousands of dollars, but generally deals in the millions of dollars. Um, and as a result, uh, that means that there's uh, significant risk associated with um, these deals. And as a, there's typically a lot more due diligence associated with, um, with a customer committing to make a purchase. The sales process is very different. So for the, com for the companies that I just described, Groupon, Dropbox, their sales model is all self-service. They're, they're uh, marketing directly to consumers. Consumers come, come to their website, can purchase their product directly. Whereas selling to enterprise customers, it rarely goes that way. Instead, it's a process that is based on generally sales representatives, um, outside sales, that, uh, that will build a relationship with a customer, build that, that level of trust. As a result, it's a, it's, each sale is a much more expensive proposition. It generally takes much longer to close. Um, and so it's, a, it's quite a different process. So the risks uh, for a consumer purchasing a product is generally pretty low. Uh, they're not outlaying a lot of money. Uh, for B2B, the risk can be quite high. There may be regulators involved that, uh, that need to be satisfied. Um, there is the potential for, uh, for lawsuit or uh, loss, of, um, loss of brand recognition if, uh, if the deal goes sideways. So there, there's a lot more risk in play, at play. And as a result, uh, the, the purchasing decisions tend to be much more conservative. The decision maker within a, an enterprise sale also tends to be quite different. So for B2C, it's normally the, the, the buyer and the consumer of the product tend to be the same person. So if I'm going and purchasing a Groupon deal, okay, I might be purchasing it for somebody I know, but generally I'm purchasing uh, a deal for myself. Uh, whereas when we're operating in an enterprise context, there's normally a separate procurement group which is involved in assessing uh, the offering. And they, they could be totally different than, uh, than the group that ends up uh, using uh, in this case, a software product that is, uh, that is being purchased. Um, for us, uh, where we're delivering software to utilities to offer to their, um, to their commercial customers, there's quite a broad division between, um, between who the buyer is and who the consumer is. Uh, the decision-making process tends to be very different. So for B2C, um, the consumer is going out and doing some research themselves in terms of whether or not this is a purchase that they're interested in making, whereas in the enterprise space, uh, especially for, for large commercial customers, they may be uh, regulated in order to have a more formalized purchasing process, uh, so tendering out an RFP um, and collecting a number of vendors, responses, and then assessing each of those against each other. So the purchasing process, the decision-making process, it's all, it's all quite different. So as a result, what, what, does that, what sort of impact does that have on what an MVP would look like within the, an enterprise space? Because the challenges are still the same. It's still, there's still a lot of uncertainty in terms of what, um, what, what type of product will ultimately be purchased, what type of product will realize success within the marketplace. So really what we're trying to do is figure out what, gets, what will get us to the table in order to start to have these conversations with some of these en enterprise customers. Um, and really it's going, to be, it's going to be more than a landing page. A landing page won't get you very far, at least from, from our experience, um, in terms of selling to enterprise customers. So the, the sales process simplified down significantly. Um, for an enterprise deal normally looks like this. You start with the pitch to the enterprise customer. And so for, in terms of what that means, that means having a compelling product vision uh, that, uh, that the customer will buy into. It means having collateral that can be provided to the sales team in order to, uh, in, in order to support the claims that are being made in the vision. And then training the sales staff so that they um, are articulate in terms of presenting 
uh, the, the vision, the potential of the product. So that, that's, just, that's really there just to, to get the conversation started. So that allows you to validate the product concept, whether or not you're headed in the right direction. Are, are these customers even remotely interested in, in what you have to sell? So the second step, and this is actually going to be the, the primary focus of this, the rest of this presentation, is on the demo. Um, where, so you've cleared the first hurdle, you've, you've established some connection with, uh, with the enterprise customer. Now they want to be able to see something. They want to know what this is that they're thinking about buying. Um, this, the next step on from that would be providing them with some sort of a limited access account. But the, 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 um, the precursor to that is having a demo. And really, the goal of these two steps is we want to be able to close the deal. Neither of these generally involve giving them a complete product. That's one thing that's quite important to note is that at least through the, the sort of deals that I've been involved with, um, you, can get, go, uh, you can go a long way through the sales process just by having a really convincing demo. Um, so, but we have, we have a bit of a, a catch-22 here, which is that we want to be able, to, we want to have an MVP, but we don't want to have to build out the entire product itself. So, uh, so what does that look like? Um, so I've broken it down to five steps in terms of what we've, uh, we've followed in order to build up um, an MVP for enterprise customers. So the first is we want to start with what are, the, what are the constraints that we're dealing with? What, 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 what do we know is going to be, we're going to be relatively confident in? Um, and start with that. Two, we want to defer commitment on everything else. So if there's anything that we don't have to, uh, to build or decide on uh, at, this, at this juncture, we want to be able to push that out. Three, we want to be able to leverage external products and services wherever possible. So, that's what will allow us to very quickly uh, get um, a convincing MVP to market. And then we want to be able to start simple and iterate quickly. So build something very simple. And then through the process, the learning that we get through uh, demoing it to different customers, we want to be able to expand on that um, and, uh, and alter, alter our MVP in order to be able to uh, resonate with as many potential buyers as possible. And really, the key thing is, from a, from a demo perspective, is we want to have a focus on telling a compelling story. We want to provide the customer with a reason to buy. So here's an example of what, um, the, based on our experience, of what an M MVP look, can look like from, uh, for an enterprise customer. So starting with the fixed constraint, uh, where we started with, um, I'm, and I'm assuming that a good proportion of you that are building products for enterprise customers are building web applications was we said, okay, our, our starting point is we know that we're going to be delivering a web application to utilities. As it turned out that this, this uh, even this assumption turned out to be invalid. Uh, but it did take us a very long way through the process. Um, so, but that, that, that was, the, that was the, the, the simplest starting point in terms of what the MVP meant. So as a result, that provided us with a foundation. Um, and what we did was we built a, uh, a simple, uh, simple single-page web application, which is something that's now becoming quite common. Um, it provides a number of advantages uh, from a, a quick iteration perspective. But the key thing is it was static. There was no back end. It, uh, but it, provided, it, provided it could provide significant interactivity, uh, all done and run on the client side. So in terms of these constraints, it meant that we had three tools that we were using to build up this MVP, basically HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, in virtue of this being a web application. So this allowed us to, we were able to defer commitment on what our back end was going to be. Uh, we'd started out as a, um, as a Java uh, development shop. And what I found, what we found was that Java was not providing us with uh, fast enough iteration, uh, fast enough iteration speed. We, want, we knew that we wanted to switch to something that was more dynamic, that would give us a uh, greater opportunity to iterate quickly, but we weren't sure exactly what we wanted to use. So we decided, okay, well, let's see how far we can get without actually having a back end. 
And the reality was we could make, as it turned out, we could make it very far without having, just going with a static single page web application. So we were able to run with that for three months. We did about 30 demos to prospective customers. Um, and it, it's amazing how, uh, how convincing you can make a, uh, one of these, uh, these, these SBAs look. It, it, we also didn't, we deferred commitment on data storage. So we didn't, we didn't want to worry about how the data was going to be, be persisted. We just worked with hard-coded data, which was perfect for, from a demo perspective. Because really what you want to be able to do is, is tell a good story in a consistent way. And having all that data canned and, fami and familiar to the sales team that was doing the presentation was perfect. Uh, in terms of leverage, we made extensive use of different types of web application frameworks. Uh, most significantly, uh, Knockout uh, JS, which is a, uh, a, a ver it's, it's a, uh, a data binding uh, web application framework um, that allows you to very quickly build interactive web applications um, and provides nice decoupling between um, between presentation and uh, and data. We use Bootstrap in order to provide a lot of uh, web UI controls and, um, uh, and, and look and feel. Um, so using, using these types of tools allow you to very quickly build up a, um, a fairly complex uh, web application uh, just running client side. Leverage hosting. So we, because of the fact that our application was just a, uh, a static site. There was no back end. We were able to throw the files up on Amazon S3 and serve them directly from there. So very simple, very low cost hosting. Um, and then being able to leverage third party uh, web services also allows you to integrate significantly more functionality into your MVP uh, without incurring significant development overhead. So in terms of iterating quickly, which is the, the third step, um, implementing practices like continuous deployment so that commits that were being made were being at least uh, continuously deployed into our test environment. We, we did not push our changes all the way through to production, but that whole process was automated. Having that in place right from the start because the pace of iteration was, was obviously key. Um, establishing cross-functional teams was fundamental because of the fact that the, so much of the iteration was happening on the design side. So being able to bring in the sales, the sales representatives, the marketing team, product management and development to, in order to, to, uh, to, build, to build and iterate on this product quickly was key. And then to, get the, to be able to get the feedback directly from the customers, whether it be uh, sitting in directly on customer demos so you could hear directly what customers were saying about what was being built. Um, and, uh, or conversely, getting, getting the, um, having regular meetings with the sales staff in order to get the latest feedback. So the last part was being able to tell a compelling story. Um, the process that we used was um, something that we, we developed ourselves, which we called user journeys, where it was where, where what we would do is we would uh, effectively write stories around what a user would do to interact with the software. But it was a, com a complete journey rather than uh, the typical implementation of user stories tends to be very, um, very segmented and small uh, based on uh, units of, that can be implemented quite quickly. Whereas our focus was let's focus on uh, identifying, because we were looking to tell a story, we'd build a persona, we'd look at what, what was the context that would bring them in to interact with the application, what would they do within the application. Normally that may span several, um, several sessions of interacting with the application because more often than not, that's what's required. Customers don't just go in once and get everything that they need, often they'll have to go in check something out externally, come back and validate it. So build, building up these sort of workflows was, uh, was we, we found to be hugely valuable. And what we found was that it was personas that, that really worked. I, I've had experience uh, working with teams building up personas in the past, and normally people have a lot of fun producing the personas. They're, they're, they're great, they're interesting, 
But then, then people get onto the real work and they, the personas tend to get left behind. Whereas in this process, the personas were key components of our stories. They were the stories that we were telling in our demos. And as a result, everybody knew who these people were. They were manifest in the system, so there was data associated. In this case, Bob Johnson, who's the manager of a hotel. There was data, uh, so Bob Johnson had an account in the software. His hotels were represented. When our staff, uh, sales staff would go in and would demo the product, they would log in as Bob, and they would walk through the way that Bob would interact with the software. And that proved to be hugely valuable for us. It exposed tens, tons of problems where uh, where we had built up features that we thought would be useful, but then when it came to actually telling a story about how somebody would actually use them, it tended to fall very flat. So um, the, this, this, this for us was, was a key part of being able to um, provide convincing, convincing demos, tell convincing stories um, to our prospective customers. The key benefit of this it also meant that we focus much more on workflows rather than on individual features. So it was how, what was the path to value for these customers? Um, we wanted it to be as simple as possible, as intuitive as possible, especially for customers in, in, our, in our user journeys that were coming in for the first time. So how would they find, what, what was the reason for coming in? We wanted to clearly articulate that. And then how would they be able to find that? And, and then we, we could validate those with uh, th those types of stories with actual customers that um, the personas were archetypes of. So we were able to do all of this with just a static site. No, no backend functionality, no data persistence. Um, we, you could test out all the workflows. Um, and we were able to iterate extremely quickly. Um, and none of the customers ever questioned whether or not this was a fully built out and functioning application. The nice thing about working in, in, uh, in the enterprise context is because of the fact that the procurement process is long, you can make these types of representations to customers and with the assumption that you can, you can build in what you need by the time that the deal's closed and the product is actually delivered to the customer. Is it, does, has anybody had this type of experience in terms of uh, building these very simple prototypes for customers? Yeah? How, how many people have, have done something similar to what I've described here? Absolutely, absolutely. I, the, and the, I, at least from what we found, uh, having uh, ensuring that the sales team is is suitably trained and they know where some of the pitfalls are, they know where there's a button that goes nowhere, um, where they can kind of hand wave and talk about what uh, what the customer would see if that button was clicked on, is normally normally sufficient. There there are definitely uh, definitely pitfalls. Um, though I, I think we found we were able to navigate around most of them, and that the risk was not as great as we perceived that they might be. The bigger, the bigger challenge was getting the sales team really comfortable with doing the demos, confident that they could go through, especially given the pace of change um, that was happening. Did, any, any, other, any other stories or experiences about uh, doing something similar to this? When the salespeople are on the field, uh, they don't end up facing a lot of technical glitches mm. uh, because they are not dependent on you know the back end, the platform, the servers, and things like that. So it just makes it so portable for them to actually go out and actually show it without you know having any major technical glitches. Absolutely. So dealing with unreliable connectivity. Yeah. Yeah.
Uh, so in this case, it's actually building a website that uh, supports interactivity. So there's navigation between pages. Um, there are forms that can, uh, in dialogues, that pop up that you can interact with. You can log in as different types of customers. We present uh, data on charts, uh, but it's all it's all canned. None of it is none of it is being supplied by a, um, by a, a backend um, to support it. Um, so it provides it provides the illusion of a a fully fledged application uh, without without necessarily having that foundation. Now, in our case, we had a little bit of a luxury because of the fact that we had. We had ex an, uh, an existing flagship product which did a lot of this in the back end. So we were very confident that we could deliver on the back end. Um, we just were, we, but we knew that we could defer making that commitment for as long as possible. Some other comments? Go ahead. Yeah, so that's a great question. I, it, it's, e even with this, where we're able to iterate very quickly, you could still iterate much faster with, at a whiteboard or with paper prototypes. And so that we would use as the precursor to, uh, to, to getting this far. Uh, that, that would be used to decide you know, what, what would actually get put into, into this. Um, but we were uh, generally uh, uh, Delivering, delivering new screens or new features once a week. And so as a result, that iteration was happening, uh, was happening quite quickly and on an ongoing basis. Yeah, please. So the question is, uh, does, is the customer aware that this is just vaporware, um, or, uh, um, or, or are they in the dark about it? Um, we, we did, so one thing, en enterprise customers tend to be quite conservative in their buying habits. And so for them to, uh, to, 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 to for it to be revealed that, uh, that, this is, that there's nothing necessarily behind this would make them quite uncomfortable. So we generally would not expose that. Um, if, if pressed, then you, know, you can do it without necessarily uh, telling, telling a lie. What we found most of the time, they didn't, they, they just bought it. They just kind of believed what it was that they were seeing. They bought into the illusion. And uh, that, was, that was sufficient. Obviously, you know, there's some risk because we're really hedging our bets and assuming that the procurement process is going to be long enough for us to be able to actually build out all the things that we need. Um, but uh, but it, was, it was a risk worth taking. And the thing is, because of the fact that the key, our key objective is on learning, in the event that we actually needed to kill a deal because of the fact that we would not be able to deliver on the timeline that was set up, that would be okay because it would be a validation of the, uh, of, of the product that we were planning to build. There, we would be able to find, we were confident we'd be able to find other uh, customers that would then be interested in following suit. Please. Yeah. So the comment was um, ensuring that you have a, a team that is ready to actually deliver on this if, uh, if the customer bites, and a team that is agile ready that can deliver this as quickly as possible. So I mean, in our situation, we don't have a, uh, a lot of idle capacity. Um, so it's the same team that's involved in building up the MVP as would be involved in delivering it. I mean, our, it, with, 
landing a few larger deals, we'd be able to hire on some additional people. But absolutely. Please, sorry. Who, who is speaking? Actually, how about, how about you first? Because you, you haven't said anything. Uh, so they, the sales team would participate in the in uh, many of the product design meetings, and then uh, members of the product de development team would uh, participate and attend uh, the demos that were done for customers. Make sense? Uh, question here: When did you actually started uh, working on the back end? Was it like once you really got the deal, or was it more like uh, after a particular logical point? So the, the point that we introduced the back end was at the point where, uh, where we actually needed to, have pers we needed to have data persistence. So we needed to be able to introduce functionality into the MVP that, that really could not be faked. Um, and uh, a big part of what we uh, wanted to tell a compelling story about was about the initial user experience, so the initial user journey for new customers that were signing into the software for the first time, well, what did that process look like? And we found that it was difficult to deliver that without actually introducing a back end. So. so what was more like a gap between, you know, uh, when you got the first deal uh, implemented, you know, or you got the first deal uh, and when you started, I mean, when you started and when you got the first deal? Was it how, how much of a time span you know you had actually? I mean, uh, so for us, it I mean we we didn't know how how much time we had. Um, as it turned out, uh, we had eight months. Um, but initially, it looked like we could have two or three months. Um, you, you just you don't necessarily know. Um, but the customers are the customers are making their purchasing decision on the basis of what's there. So. Uh, you're normally just obligated to deliver what you've been able to demonstrate within the MVP. So as the MVP, the MVP became more sophisticated over time, at a certain point in time, the risk associated with delivering it was significant, so significant that we needed to start to put more, uh, more of a foundation in place for it. Uh, so we've... Um, so today we have, uh, for, for this specific product, which we started on uh, just over a year ago, um, we, we have uh, three significant customers. Um, though most of them have just come within the last couple of months. So one, one thing about selling to enterprise customers as well is um, relatively few of them want to be the first to bite. And so I, finding, finding that early adopter and then st structuring the deal in such a way that allows you to talk about uh, talk about that, that arrangement um, allowed some, some subsequent customers to follow. But the, these are uh, large uh, energy utilities. And this product that I'm describing is uh, in the process of being rolled out to uh, one of Europe's largest energy utilities. It will go out to, um, it will go out to 50,000 of their small to medium commercial customers um, within the next four to five months. It, it's uh, I, one, one thing about the marketplace that we're operating in is it, it's quite immature and it's evolving quickly, which is part of the reason why uh, we put a very high emphasis on MVP because it was really not clear what was going to resonate with with the commercial market. What 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 kind of services would uh, commercial customers want to interact with in order to be able to realize energy efficiency? Um, with our ex with our existing flagship product, we'd had that the experience of building something up that uh, um, that that customers 
said they were interested in, but had fairly low levels of actual usage and didn't achieve the kinds of results that we were looking for. So we knew we wanted to do something a bit different. Um, and this was, uh, this approach was our attempt to see what else, what else we could come up with. So basically you're leading the dance. Yes, absolutely. In this case, there is, um, there's, there's no uh, existing demand. We're in, the, we're in the process of trying to create demand. Uh, moreover, well, I mean, any demand creation activity is basically an exercise in behavior change. So what we're trying to do is be able to foster behaviors that would, um, that it would encourage the use of the application. Um, so create a demand where there wasn't one before. Not, not in this presentation. Um, tomorrow, I'm, there's, uh, it's, it's kind of, a, I'm doing a presentation that's a more in-depth experience report uh, based on the organizational change that we made in order to come up with this. Um, it's, we, we, we underwent a company-wide pivot, um, and so I'm gonna talk about, talk about that and uh, about what that experience was like to go through. It's tomorrow, yeah. Whoops. Just going to quickly do a time check. I, I, I think it's great to get all of these uh, these questions. Um, is there okay? Well, I'll take one more comment and then I'll move on with the presentation. Uh, I think uh, what you just answered uh, to his question, this type of methodology might work when you're trying to create a demand because if if such a uh, product already exists in the market, uh, you might you might keep do, uh, doing uh, developing this minimum value products but the other other company might win the uh, client and uh, how do you justify the cost of your minimum value products which you are doing I, I think that that's all, always a risk and I don't think it's necessarily um, th this problem is necessarily endemic to the environment where we're in uh, because really what it is it's it's a, it's a process of trying to find what, what, your, um, what your competitive advantage is, what your market differentiator is going to be. Um, and so you could be in an established, in a very well established market and want to do this type of iteration in order to figure out what's really going to make your product stand out from the pack. What kind of problems are existing customers having? In fact, where we started with this was um, uh, our initial set of requirements came from an RFP. And one, one thing about, uh, for, for those people that are uh, working with enterprise customers that issue RFPs, um, RFPs make it very difficult to have a strong product differentiator because effectively uh, the buyer is asking, is asking each customer to meet these list of requirements. And as a result, you end up with a lot of homogeneity within the marketplace. So you still have to figure out what developer it tends to be more symptomatic of, of a, an organizational problem uh, rather than a problem with the notion of being driven by feedback received from customers um, during demos per se. I mean, obviously you don't want to be reactive where every little bit of feedback that you're getting from a customer you're immediately going and responding to and building. And that's where product management comes in is, uh, is, is leveling out those requirements and figuring out the ones that are are, are truly high priority, priority. But having software that does, uh, that, that, is, uh, that is easily demoable is highly valuable. So really what we want is de uh, demonstrability to be a first class concern of the application that we build, as opposed to something that gets bolted on later. I mean, I, I, my experience in the past of building up products is that we don't, like the, the, um, the, the, the product is built um, based on a list of requirements, thinking about uh, the end user rather than thinking about what, uh, what is going to convince the, uh, the buyer to purchase. And so bringing some of those thoughts into the, um, the, the design process and the construction process early on, I think is actually quite valuable. So one of the things that we had in right from the start is the ability to reset 
the application, at least for demo accounts, back to a known state. So that's a key aspect. We, initially, obviously, we didn't need to worry about this because we had no back end. There was no persistence. Refreshing the browser was sufficient in order to undo all the state change that had happened during the course of a demo. That was another pitfall that the sales team obviously needed to be aware of. Uh, but, uh, but then carrying that through, once the back end was in place, that for these accounts, we could ensure that no matter what, they were always back to a, a known state. Uh, made the software much easier to be able to consistently demo. And that's something that I, I, has generally had to be retrofitted onto applications that I've worked on in the past, and it's normally been a fairly messy process. Um, another benefit that we found, especially with this, uh, this rich client approach uh, and, worrying, and deferring commitment on the implementation of the back end, was it turned out that uh, it made it very easy for us to be able to uh, implement uh, services uh, that would support the functionality that had been fleshed out within the client. And because of the fact that the, the iteration had already largely happened on the front end, the, the, the interfaces to the services that we built to support it were much more stable. Um, and we could really focus on what the service design was. Um, using, uh, using an MVC framework on the client side also helped in this regard because we had um, we had, dedicated, uh, we, we had dedicated models that would communicate with specific types of services. Um, and really, it kept us focused on the user, telling the story that, the, that what we were delivering, what was going to be delivered to the user, what was the story that the user was going to, what was the, the user's experience going to be, um, and deferring commitment on everything else. And really focusing on speed, so having that high pace of iteration built in right from the start because we knew we needed to be able to move quickly on it. Um, in terms of the, the, the effect on the culture of the team, it really also encouraged um, much more of a, uh, a growth mindset in the team because um, it meant that we had a lot more uh, developers within the team that were active in product design. We had sales that were active in product design. Really, typically what I've seen in terms of um, the notion of cross-functional teams has been focused on the delivery side, so building things up. But with the um, with the key the key challenge and key constraint being on the design side, having cross-functional design teams, uh, I think, is really uh, where um, a lot of the benefit comes from in terms of being able to bring together different uh, different experts and bodies of knowledge within the organization to be involved and iterate on the design very quickly. And that meant more people stepping outside of what their comfort zone was and saying, oh, I, I don't know how to design an application or a product, um, providing a forum for that to happen. So again, a focus on having, having T-shaped people involved in this process. So we wanted to have people who had the depth of experience, whether they be technical, to say, okay, yes, this is technically feasible or not, um, or uh, salespeople saying, yes, this is what um, this is the feedback we're getting from customers. Marketing, this is what we're seeing from the market, etc. But coming together and sharing their experience. So, uh, behind any sort of a um, an MVP are a set of key value hypotheses. So basically, what, what is the, the key assumptions that we're trying to validate as a product of building, uh, building up this product? And within an enterprise context, I think that there's basically two. One is, will customers buy our product, which is really most of what I've been talking about so far, um, and which I call the, the purchase assumption. People will buy what we have. Uh, the other is, will users find the product to be valuable? Um, which I call the value assumption. So the purchase assumption, it tends to be, it tends to be more immediate because if nobody's going to buy it, then if there, there's not much point uh, going forward uh, with it. And it tends to be much, a much simpler thing to test. We can test it through demos. We can test it through talking to customers. The value assumption is, is more difficult, um, and, but it's ultimately more important because if what we've delivered is... Um, uh, we, we can sell it, but once it gets to market, it's going to fall flat, then that's going to kill any uh, future opportunities that we have. So, um, but it, it's harder from a, from a testing perspective um, in terms of being able to test products within customers. Um, the key thing to, for us for, to keep in mind is that 
the, um, the customer, the buyer's perception of value or what users will value could be, is very different than what uh, users really value. So that's what I was mentioning before. So to, do, to focus on the, the value um, assumption, um, what we were doing concurrently with uh, the demos that we were running for customers was to actually do uh, concrete user testing uh, with the end users for the customer um, and validate that the, the journeys that we were creating were, were valuable. Um, and we could, do the same, we could do the same type of testing with the MVPs, the, the MVP that we built up um, as we could through the demos that we ran. Um, the big thing, the big learning for us in this regard was to be able to set up a context that would allow us to run small pilots on our own, independent of the buyer, with a set of a set of handpicked customers. They may be cus in our case, we were fortunate because we had an existing customer base, and so we were able to pull some of those customers out and and move them over and have them trial the the new product and get their feedback. Um, but uh, but that that was key as well. So to summarize, uh, key, key takeaways are recognizing that there, in, in the enterprise space where there is this separation between the buyer and the end user, um, that there are two value, there, there are two uh, key hypotheses um, and we want to be able to ensure that we're testing both, both of them. Um, and that there are the five steps that I outlined earlier to design an, uh, an enterprise MVP um, are a good place to start. So specifically, identifying what, what are the fixed known constraints that you have to work with because having some amount of constraint is essential um, to get going. Defer commitment on everything else and you can be surprised at how much you can actually defer until later. Um, so as I talked about, we, we had no back end, it was just a static static site, and we were able to get a lot of mileage out of that. Um, leverage, leverage external products and services where possible, especially anything that's not related to your key, um, uh, your, your key domain area. Um, and the th there, are, there are so many services out there now that it, it really makes it possible to assemble products very, very quickly. Um, start simple, iterate quickly, and then focus on telling a compelling story. So that's, that's it for the presentation. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so some additional questions that people might have had that weren't addressed with the remaining slides. Uh, so we, we did use the Lean Canvas approach. Um, and I quite like it. Um, and it, uh, it, it was really interesting to see to see how that iterated over time. How many people are here are familiar with uh, the Lean Canvas? Ashmaria's uh, Lean Canvas work. It's, it's, if, if you are um, starting in on building up a new product, it's a great thing to try out uh, to see if you can uh, to fill in. Effectively, what it does is it distills uh, many of the key considerations associated with building a new product down into uh, a limited set of categories. Within, that would fit within a, I think it's an A5 sheet. Please. You, you know, whatever you are trying to, uh, you know, put into the demo, how would you validate that in the enterprise scenario? Because it's just a demo, right? Right. Uh, the, 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 um, the validation was generally more uh, qualitative than quantitative. So it was effectively what, um, what customers were telling us, at least in terms of the, um, the, the sales demos. Uh, with, the, um, with, with the user testing, that could be a little bit more quantitative um, in terms of the discoverability of features um, and the overall intuitive, intuitiveness of the product. Um, but it's, uh, so I, I think that what you're hitting at, hitting at is um, that one of the mechanisms for being able to do validation of, uh, of products to ensure that you're moving in the right direction is to do things like split testing. Um, 
that it tends to work if you've got large sample sizes and trying to do split testing with the kind of sample sizes that you're likely to have with enterprise products is, uh, is more difficult. So as a result, we relied a lot more on that type of qualitative feedback. In the back. Yeah. So I think in the enterprise cycle, uh, the enterprise is very a lot about the scalability, the non-functional side of things also, right? Yes. So any uh, thoughts on that? Did you uh, work towards that end in this model? Uh, so not, not through the MVP, um, but uh, certainly through the, the sort of deals that we, uh, that we went through, there was a due diligence process, um, normally where considerations around security, scalability, service levels uh, were considered. Um, but at least from my experience, they, te they tend not to be assessed, per se, uh, prior to getting far enough through the, um, through the sales process. So again, it's about, ha it's about having a compelling story. We, we were fortunate in as much as we, um, we were starting from a position where we had an existing product in market that we could refer to um, as, being, as, as being an explanation of the foundation that we would provide for this product. Um, but uh, um, but I, I think that it's, it is definitely a consideration, but it normally comes a little bit further down the, um, the sales cycle. Uh, please. So, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Did our customers ask us about scalability? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so scalability was definitely a consideration. Um, and uh, it was something that, but it's not something that you can necessarily demo uh, through an MVP. Um, it's something that, uh, as, as I was just saying, we were able to talk about based on our existing product and the foundation that we had established there. Um, even though that product was not, that foundation was not yet being used by the, uh, the MVP that we were demoing to these customers. Please. So why did you pick on a web application? So that, that's a good question. Uh, so the question was, why do we start with web application instead of mobile? Um, and uh, the, the answer is twofold. One is that it was what the buyers were asking for. They were asking for uh, web portals that they could offer to their customers. Um, and, but mobile was always seen as being an additional, uh, as, an, as an additional value add. And so, uh, and we felt that we were able to meet that and demo that through uh, some of the frameworks that we use. So using, for example, a, a flexible um, grid-based layout framework for, uh, or responsive layout for, uh, for web applications allows you to have a consistent web interface um, that with relatively minor style tweaks renders effectively on a, um, on a mobile device. So um, that, that allowed us to um, build a, a web application that was mobile ready without expending a lot of effort associated with trying to, um, trying to support a, a large, support on and demo on a large variety of mobile platforms. Um, so it did allow us to show that, um, you know, we could show the application running on an iPhone and show how, how the, uh, how the screen, uh, the layout responded to that um, reduced screen size. So it was a responsive app. It was a responsive app, yeah. So, but l largely achieved just in virtue of the, the frameworks that we were using. Um, I, yeah, and that, that was actually part of our MVP process. Within the first three months, we used four different grid layout frameworks uh, and just swapped one out after another. We ultimately used Bootstrap, and that's what's got I would say the most momentum behind it right now, um, but uh, but that was that was key.
Oh, it was absolutely, it was incremental. So we started with, we started with just the functionality that we needed to be able to provide persistence around and implemented a service for that. And then slowly over time we moved uh, functionality from the, cli from the client to the server. Um, and we found that we could do that actually very quickly. Yes. That's right. No, no, no service, no server side, no backend, no persistence. All done with CAN data. Uh, the the product backlog really evolved as we went along. Um, so it was based on, it was based on uh, what we found customers were interested in uh, from the demos that we were running. And then from the, the user testing that we were doing. Yeah. Uh, t there was, to a certain extent, um, it, it really just came down to decision making process. Uh, Yes, in, within this context, yes. As, as product lead, that was, that was my responsibility, was working together with our product management group and the other stakeholders involved in order to charter the path for the product. What we, what we, part of, part of uh, the sales collateral that's produced is to provide a, a product roadmap, so to show where the product is going to go. Um, but. I mean, there's, there's not necessarily any commitment on that until after the deal is signed. So we had enough, um, we had enough large features in the backlog. Like, I mean, there, there's, as you said, there, there's, uh, there, there's no shortage of ideas. Um, it was really, what, what, could we, what could we test out as quickly as possible? What could we validate as quickly as possible? Absolutely. Hello. Hey. Hey. Hi. Uh, hi. By the way, f uh, first up, great talk. Uh, Thank you. Right. That, that was awesome. So I, I have a question. My question is, uh, so, so say, for example, you've identified your problem. One. Two, you come up with the specs for your MVP, all right, which is features A, B, C, that really solve this particular problem. And now you're taking it to the market to figure out whether there's an actual demand. One. And is it you're validating whether you're actually solving a customer's problem? Now, when you take it to an enterprise customer, he tells you that, you know what, ABC features are really awesome, but I want XYZ. Yep. Now, when you come back to your, you know, to your drawing board, you realize that, oops, my MVP maybe needs to be tweaked. Yes. Then, it's just the first customer. Now, I go to another customer, he still tells me, tells me, you know, tells me that, you know what, this is awesome, but I need XYZ as well. Yep. My question is, how, what is the safest path here when you really don't have a lot of customers giving you qualitative feedback all right, what is the safest MVP path that you would suggest when you're really uncertain whether is it the right customer, it's just a po possibly a potential that showed interest, or maybe we should go ahead and add that feature to your, to your MVP as well? Uh, so th that's, I think it's a difficult question to answer. Um, and I wish we could say that, I could say that we had a lot of rigor around that process. It was really driven based on um, what we felt had the, gr the, which deal had the greatest potential of closing. So where do we feel we have the, the greatest momentum with that specific customer? Um, and then how quickly could we turn around and produce something that would, that would demonstrate the direction that we would head in for that? At the same time, though, um, what we were really trying to do was validate some of the feedback that we were getting within the marketplace. And so we were doing that through a few mechanisms. One was we had uh, an advisory board which consisted of um, in this case, the product was for small to medium commercial customers, so it consisted of different, different business owners um, that we would uh, present concepts to, normally in, in the form of lo-fi lo prototypes. Um, and uh, just, just to, as, as a way to, to check to see whether or not what we're hearing was actually um, so, something, a direction that we wanted to head in. Um, that, 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 was kind of, that was our reality check. 
our, our company is it's not a it's not a huge company, and so normally we're we're talking to you know, maybe 10, 10 prospects, ten utilities at a time. The market is also not that huge within North America. I mean, there's a lot of um, the, the U.S. utility market is deregulated, so there's a lot of smaller players. But for the kind of deals that we're talking about, um, we're really looking at uh, a handful of, of large regulated utilities. Um, and so as a result, it's, uh, it, the, the, the requirements were not really all, all that much all over the map. There, there are definitely some differences, and so part of it was yeah, it was really looking at you know what do we what do we have what what's our what's our foundation um, and what do we want to be able to build upon. So, for example, at, at the risk of being too technical, uh, within our, our specific domain, um, a number of utilities are interested in services around demand response. So, what that means is they're they've got uh, peak demand management issues. So if there are demand spikes at certain times of day, they want to be able to provide financial incentives to customers in order to be able to consume that load elsewhere, like later or earlier or whatever. And, uh, and we knew that that was functionality that would bring us in with uh, a set of utilities. Um, but that was not functionality that we had a lot of experience with. And so we did not focus on that. To the same, I mean, we knew that you know it was potentially out there. We could put it on our roadmap, but it wasn't where we were going to start. We were going to start with the stuff that we knew a little bit better. I don't know. Does that? It's 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 a bit of it, a a bit of a uh, rambling response, but I hope that helps. Yeah, it did uh, you know give some idea in terms of uh, you know? So this is the this is the same uncertainty that uh, we had faced uh, while. Uh, actually chalking out our MVP because every time we took it to customers they would come up with XYZ now and now you're back to the drawing board and now you're like okay does our MVP truly represent you know a, a generic solution that could that could uh, you know that 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 appeals to a lot more users than just a specific set of users so that, it was really difficult and I wanted to like know your thoughts and yeah so, so that's that some of it was also doing market research in order to figure out how many how many potential customers actually had that specific problem? Um, so we could assess the size, the size of the, the the market associated with building that up. But normally, given the fact that we were able to to build up these fairly superficial features quite quickly, um, we would take risks where where we thought that it would pay out. Please.
the, the, the key thing with the um, with the, the minimal viable product is that it's it's not a it's not a fully featured product. It, it may not even be a usable product. Um, it's it, it's really there to help you test um, what the key assumptions are underlying your business model. So if you see that the key risk within this product that you're delivering within the financial service market is customers uh, purchase, like basically purchasing stock, closing a deal, is that the risk? Then that would be the focus of your MVP. If it's identifying which specific stocks to research and then purchase, if, that, if the risk is on the research side, then maybe that's where you want to focus and then just assume that, you know, the, that the purchasing process, it will, it will take care of that or you're going to test it at a later point. So it's really more about structuring the experiment around what you perceive as being the most significant areas of risk so that you can maximize learning rather than trying to build out something simple but broad. So our, the key areas of risk that we were trying to assess is can we con can we uh, convince energy utilities to buy this product from us? And two, is this product actually valuable to the utilities and customer? So th those were our two biggest, biggest concerns. Um, and so our MVP was, was fully focused on attempting to, uh, to, to, uh, to validate those. Please. Sorry, dedicated what? No, we do. Yes. So it was. So, but so the question was, did we have a dedicated team that was involved in doing this? Yes, it was a, a dedicated team that was involved in in building up the MVP and then and carrying that through into its product implementation phase. Did that answer your question, or did you have a follow on? So uh, you know, we may ask uh, some of the free cycles of. Uh, uh, a team who is otherwise engaged in other activities to do that. So I was wondering how we will be able to balance the demand from the marketing team for taking the MVP to a certain customer demo um, versus you know his priorities for the other mainstream product in that situation. I, I understand it's not the case in your, but I, I think in terms of balancing demand, and this touches on what Craig Larman was talking about this morning, um, but having having the, the, the marketing representative part of the product design team um, so that they have some owner, ownership over that process as well and that they recognize what's involved in, in the production, uh, what some of the competing demands are, um, and have a sense of ownership over the results goes a long way to, to, to mitigate some of the, the driving force behind that demand. Please. Basically, I come from the R&D team. Because, uh, I'm just looking, is there a thumb rule, like you take so many MVP per iteration or things like that? Because generally, what, uh, from the R&D per se, it's like we've been bombarded with M MVP. And uh, it's like, I understand that uh, from the marketing perspective, they have their own pre agenda. But then I don't see that there's a, a defined MVP that the engineering team can take at some point. Because we end up doing POC, and finally, we kind of narrow down, OK, we can only take so much. Um, from, your, from your experience, do you? Is there a way you kind of uh, you know channelize it and uh, give a list of MVP to the uh, to the R&D team? I, I'm sorry, I'm actually having a hard time hearing you. Okay. Uh, see, see, my concern is like, is there a thumb rule like uh, in terms of number of MVP that will be given to a uh, R&D team, or it's like randomly given? Sorry, is there is there a thumb rule about what? The number of MVP that's given to the R&D team to develop. It's a, a thumb rule about the number of MVP that are given to the R and D team. Given. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, not necessarily. I, I mean, it's it depends on the number of experiments that you want to run and what your capacity is to run those experiments. So for us, uh, we, had, we had two MVPs that we were running concurrently. Uh, one that was started earlier, which is most of what I've talked about here, and another uh, which we pivoted to um, in, in November and 
uh, sold to utility in December, and that is my core focus right now. Um, but uh, that's it, it. wasn't like it wasn't like we had a lot a lot of MVPs, and so the the it, it's a product. It's not a it's not a feature. So it's. Uh, uh, it, for us, at least, it carried on over the course of several months where we were continually iterating on it, maybe adding features, taking some features out. There were a lot of features that we uh, that got discarded over the the course of the uh, of the learning process. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, uh, to the extent possible, I was, I was actually looking at is there kind of a number like you kind of project to the R&D team in terms of MAP? But it uh, looks like that's, that's not the case. No. Yeah. Any further questions? Please. Uh, so vari variations in terms of what the customer is looking for? Yeah. yeah. So okay, I mean the key thing is this is so okay. One one of the um, when selling to enterprise customers, I, I think what you're hitting on is they often want a certain level of customization associated with what it is that they're going to see, and so we knew that that was something that we needed to be able to meet, and we needed to be able to demonstrate that we could meet it, and we were able to do that through the MVP uh, in a few ways. One was obviously. For us delivering a product like this through an energy utility, it needed to be skinned and look like uh, it, 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 would, it would reflect the branding of that energy utility. So as a result, themeability was a key consideration early on. So that was something that we, were, we had right from the start, even at the point where we had um, uh, it, it was just a static, static site. Um, the other was some ability to show differentiated features for different types of customers. Um, and so we were able to demonstrate that just by hiding or showing features depending on uh, the, the user account that was logged in or um, which, you know, we, we created some demo energy utilities and so we could show the differentiation from one to another. So in terms of that, we were able to demonstrate the potential for customization without needing to do all the customization that they were asking for. Um, and then within the structure of the deal, the contract that was signed by, between us and the utility, they, they expect that, yes, they're, they're prepared to pay for a certain amount of customization activity that's going to happen in order to get it looking just how they want it. Um, and so that was, that was just kind of a, a part of our process. Does that help? So we were able to keep the core um, intact. At the same time, we had a number of features that we deemed experimental ourselves that we wanted to be able to test out through a demo, um, whether it was to see whether we're on the right track or whether to see whether or not this was an idea that they were interested in. Um, and so we could, we could e easily um, hide or show those specific features depending on uh, what the opportunity was that we were pursuing. I would say actually having having that a start, having flexibility uh, built into the product from a starting point was all, was also quite valuable because you know, we, we needed to be able to have that level of customization when it came to actually delivering the product to the customer. Any any further questions? All right. Well, thank you for for, for sticking it out, and uh, I'm more than uh, happy to talk with any of you one-on-one uh, -on -one about this some more. Thank you.